Good morning. It's uh, good to be with you again. If you have your Bible, turn to Esther chapter 3 as we continue our series for such a time as this. A lot of wonderful things happening in the life of our church. Our missions trip team to the Amazon is uh, flying back. So they had a uh, a safe week, so we're praying that they uh, come back safely. Uh, this evening kicks off the first night of Vacation Bible School, so we'll be praying for all of the volunteers and children who will be here this evening. Lots of good things going on. We're going to look at a passage this morning where there's a lot of terrible things going on. And when you think about understanding evil, I think about how stories have used villains to help us to understand uh, what is evil. When you think about what villain shaped your understanding of evil, who comes to mind in the stories that you loved? Uh, Some of you may remember uh, Snidely Whiplash. Anybody remember him from uh, the old classic cartoon? Anybody know? Dudley do or Underdog, all those, right? And so Snidely Whiplash was this like quintessential villain uh, back from the 1950s. All villains had curly mustaches back then. Um, so let's, let's make curly mustaches righteous. Uh, I say bring them back. Villains help us understand what, what, what is essentially evil or wrong. And we can intrinsically pick up on them in stories because they do things that seem to violate our conscience. That we know that... that choice is unfair or that decision is evil. We can think of uh, maybe Captain Hook, kind of the angry uh, adult in the story of Neverland where all these kids never grow up, but there's kind of this adult that's trying to seize control and he's the quintessential villain. And, uh, and then you see maybe Darth Vader shaped your childhood uh, a little bit. And uh, Darth Vader was the greatest villain in my childhood. And I think there's something so scary about realizing that the main enemy is actually your dad. Um, that's brutal. I love my dad. He's not a villain. But that was terrifying reality for me. Uh, maybe you like Cinderella and the evil stepmother who I just recently learned her. Her name is Lady Tremaine. And she's just subtly evil and vindictive and unfair to Cinderella. And she, you know, manipulates and then postures things just to always go wrong for Cinderella. And we get a sense of evil from reading these stories or watching these stories unfold. And we're going to get a sense of that this morning because we're going to be introduced to the main antagonist in this story. And a man named Haman. And we'll see the rise of Haman in his plot to destroy the Jews in chapter 3. And this story pictures Haman having all seven of the characteristics that Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says the Lord hates. And I'm just going to read them to you. The Lord hates a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, Feet that, swift, uh, that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And one who sows discord among the brethren. Haman makes the list of the classic villains, I think, when I think about villains. And he fulfills all of those things that God says he hates. And so that should be a warning to us as we examine our own heart and mind. But I think in the story of Esther, it's another reminder that the greatest of villains are no match for our great God. So this morning's big idea as we read this passage is that evil intentions are no match for God's ultimate plan. And so let's read together and continue the story as we kind of get to see what God is doing behind the scenes, how he continues to shut up, set, set up this, this great redemptive story of rescue. So in verse 1 of chapter 3, the writer says, After these things, King Ahusiris promoted Haman, the Agatite, the son of Hamedatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. 
But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. The king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So they, as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which was the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day. And they cast in month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's law, so that is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it it please the king, let be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's businesses that they may put into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the Agaitite, and the son of Hamedatha, and the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, Do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. So we're going to see a couple things here uh, about Haman. We're going to take a look at Haman's pride. We're going to take a look at Haman's pagan perspectives and unpack Haman's plot this morning. When we look at the beginning of this passage, and we see Haman introduced, I want you to note that the Hebrew word that we translate Haman from is very close to the Hebrew word wrath. It's very uh, interesting. I I don't think it's a, a coincidence that God is a God who rescues us from wrath. And so just as God is going to rescue the Jews from Haman, who represents wrath, God Later on in scripture, we find that he will rescue us from the wrath of sin. And so this is the work of God, that he is a God that overcomes wrath and wrathful people. So Haman is interesting because he's put into a position. He's introduced as being promoted, and he's put above all the officials, and all the king's servants were were given this decree to, to bow down to him, to acknowledge him for his position and his power. And so Haman demonstrates pride, uh, quintessentially, I think, in his response. He wants to be affirmed. He wants his power to be acknowledged. He has climbed the political ladder to gain significance, money, power, and control. And these are things that are are antithetical of the human condition that none of us can handle power, fame, and money. They just they can corrupt our heart so quickly if we're not leaning on the spirit. And so pride leads to the sins of coveting praise that we see when Haman is upset that Mordecai does not bow down to him. 
that he wanted power, that he wanted wealth. See, villains want significance. They want maybe fame, maybe they want power, they want their vision of how things should be, and most of the time, a self-benefiting. This is true of the human heart. See, each of us are going to struggle to not become the villain in our own story. Don't overestimate your own importance. Haman does. And he elevates himself, and he thinks, I'm just below the king, and I'm going to posture myself where I can't get any higher than I am right now. I'm safe, I'm secure, I'm going to get to execute my will, but God had other plans. And so it's interesting that his pride leading him to covet wealth and, and praise and power also allows him to become easily offended by those who don't bow before him or give him validation and recognition. It's interesting to me, when you study villains, most of the time they're fragile. They, they're, they're overly emotional and they're easily offended or easily threatened. Haman is the highest office in the land just below the king and he's threatened and offended by one official who doesn't stand. He's about to lose his marbles over this one guy that he, wa- he wants to stir up this destruction of the Jews. This fits well with Proverbs sixteen eighteen. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. See, Haman is a great example that pride blinds us to the true source of blessings. He could have been content. He could have enjoyed his office and all of the the wealth that he had inherited. He could have chosen to, to help develop this kingdom. But no, he's fixated on himself and his own issue. So for us as followers of God, I think we need to hear this, that we need to trust in God's person and work rather than craving human approval. See, the villain wants affirmation that they're great. They want affirmation that they're in control, that they're the mightiest, that they're the strongest, that they're the victor. And that's normal for humans to feel that way because of our sinful nature. And Haman has had a lot that have played into the development of his sinful nature. We're going to look at his pagan perspectives for a moment. If we study Old Testament history, you'll see that Haman continues historical animosity that's brewed between the Amalekites and the Jews. And the Amalekites were a people who would attack uh, the Israelites as they were traveling out of Egypt. And so you had all these stragglers. When you're moving hundreds of thousands of people through the desert, it's no small thing. So the Amalekites would kind of a come and attack, and they would kind of have these small raids and attack the weak and pillage those who were straggling behind. And we see this in, in Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19. It reads, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land, he is giving you to possess as an inheritance. You shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So there's a couple things that stick out to me when you read that passage and understanding. The Amalekites must have heard about this massive group of people that have fled Egypt. And understanding that their God has led them out from the greatest empire in the known land at the time under Pharaoh. The Egyptians were powerful, but God wipes them out in the Red Sea. Israelites continue to travel. And the Amalekites think, hey, well, we can go pick a fight with these people too. We're not afraid of their God. And I think that's interesting. They had no fear of God, verse 18 said, in Deuteronomy 25. See, this is really the heart of the issue. They're not concerned with the Israelites' God. They're not concerned with the God of the universe. They do not respect him. And this is interesting because this animosity between these peoples continues. If you look at the story in 1 Samuel 15, Saul battles the Amalekites, and God tells him to go wipe these people out and gives them an order to destroy all the stuff that they own. Don't keep it. And so Saul decides to disobey God. 
He disobeys God, and then uh, he's punished for it, and God has this word where he, he almost sa- he says, uh, in English it translates, I regret the decision to make you king. And this, this means, this is, you have removed my favor from you because of your disobedience. And then Saul ends up killing Agag, the king of the Amalekites. So this is important because Haman is one of two characters that we get the lineage of in Esther. Mordecai and Haman are the only people who we kind of get to know their family history and where they're from. And this is important because it helps us kind of understand what has bred in terms of the animosity between these two people. So I read Esther, and one of the questions I had, why would Mordecai stand? Well, you know, he, he had told Esther to keep her lineage secret. He's definitely different than, you know, Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refuse to bow and are thrown into a furnace. So why pick this moment? What stirs up this decision? And the text doesn't specify, but it gives us enough clues to understand that there is much that has happened between the history of these two peoples. Exodus 17, 16 reads, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So Mordecai, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, who ends up being where Saul comes from. So Mordecai has lineage with Saul. He's, he's a relative, distant relative of Saul. That's, that's one of his family from past generations. And Haman is likely a descendant from King Agag. And so there's this tension here that stirs. And once Mordecai lets be known, I'm a Jew, that's why I'm not bowing, Haman hears that, and it's not, I just want to, I'm offended by this one individual. No, I want to now blot out all of the Jews. I think his racism is on display. And it's interesting because pride blinds us to the humanity of others. Pride can allow us to think we're greater, and I don't see value in somebody else. This is a danger for us when we look at our enemies, when we look at those who have worldviews that are contrary to our own, we think that we have the right to determine that they have no value. But I want you to hear this. Because they are humans, they have value because they're God's creation. There's this word uh, or this phrase in, uh, in Greek, the, the imago Dei, that they're made in the image of God. A philosopher would talk through that you have value because you are human made in the image of God. Of God, And so pride can be a dangerous thing because it begins to allow us to think that others that are made by God are less than. And I want to warn you not to be Haman. See, villains don't guard against seeking recognition or material gain at the expense of humility or, or gratitude. Haman's not humble. Haman expresses no thankfulness for his rise. Simply, he's offended by one Jew. And then he begins to look to make decisions that are rooted in pagan tradition. Look with me at verse 7 of chapter 3. It says, In the first month was it the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year, King Ahasuerus, they cast purr, that is, they cast lots before Haman day after day. And they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. So this is interesting because he looks to astrological guidance. And this is contrasted with the, the Jews' view of God's sovereignty. And you're going to see in, ju- in just in a, a few short uh, verses when he, uh, Mordecai is interacting with Esther. Later on in the story, we're going to see that, that Mordecai has a belief that God's going to provide. That even if Esther chooses not to advocate to the king for her people, another way will present itself. And so he believes in that. That's his posture. And that's such a contrast with, with Haman's posture because Haman's trying to sort out what are the sciences telling me? What are, what are, what are the man-made systems? What are the, these mystical, unspiritual things telling me that then I can determine and control? And I think this is great because it's contrasted with Proverbs 16.33. It says, the lot is cast into the lap. 
but it's every decision is from the Lord. So Haman's thinking, I'm going to leave this up to chance. I'm going to use this this mythical tradition to kind of decide when am I going to try to go to the king? When are we going to kill the Jews? And he does all of this, and it may just seem by chance, but from a biblical perspective and from a godly perspective, we get to hear that there is no such thing, that God is the one who determines what lot is cast. This is helpful for us because when we understand this villain, his worldview is pagan. His worldview is antithetical to God. It's opposed to him. And so this is something we see all throughout Scripture. Jesus said this to his disciples. Listen, they hate me, so they're going to hate you because they don't fear God. This has been a generational belief that has happened all the way back from the Old Testament that continues into our day and age now. People do not fear the Lord, and so they will reject the things of the Lord. You see, there will always be someone who resents devotion to the Lord. And so as you follow God, there's going to be somebody in your life that's not going to be happy about that. As you submit to God in his word and say, this is what I agree to. This is what I submit my life to. People are going to be upset by that. Don't be shocked. Don't be worried. Don't be easily offended. Don't be easily threatened because that's what the villain does. When we know, when we're warned, when God tells us that's going to happen, we can have a posture that says, yep, there are enemies and I can trust the Lord. This is an important posture for us as believers to have because we're going to see as we read the rest of this story of in Haman's plot that there are people that are out to do the people of God harm. And we may feel some of that in our day and age. We may feel that there's brewing animosity towards God and towards his people. And that is gonna stir up fear in us. That's gonna stir up worry or maybe even anxiety. We need to be a people that remind ourselves that God is the one who determines the lots that are cast. So as we continue, we look at Haman's response here, and there's some neat things to unpack in this text. He he says uh, to go meet the king in verse 8, Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If he please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hand of those who have charged the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasury. So Haman's pride has led him to try to justify his desire to annihilate the Jews. And so he goes in to meet with the king, and he's pretty manipulative. This guy's an evil villain, and he's using and leveraging all that he knows and understands, and, and this is probably how he's risen to power, is because he, he's sly. And he comes in, and he plays on two things that are going on with the king. He plays on the king's fear, and he plays on the king's failure, I believe. So if we understand that this is uh, five years after Esther has become queen, right? Because in the beginning of the chapter, it says it's the 12th year of his reign. So a lot has happened for King Xerxes. He went and, and lost the battle to the Greeks got rid of his first wife, Vashti, comes back, has the, the, this uh, beauty pageant where Esther wins, becomes queen, and five years pass. And so Haman comes into play, and he knows that uh, losing a war is expensive. And so the king is dealing with embarrassment. Maybe he's dealing with some financial losses. And then he comes in, and he plays on the king's fear that you're going to be even weaker because there's this people, ethnic group, that are going to subvert your authority, that they're going to undermine the will of the king, and they're out to get you. This is how Haman builds this fear in the king that he would accept this counsel. And the king has demonstrated he doesn't take great counsel to begin with because 
He's easily influenced by his advisors. That's why he gets rid of his first queen. And then he comes and he decides, yeah, I'm not going to think through to ask some clarifying questions like, oh, what people group are we talking about? Oh, those, those people are evil. They seem pretty docile and peaceful and um, they're, they're not a huge threat to our economy or our kingdom. He doesn't ask any of those questions. He just lets Haman drive this decision. And so he portrays the, the Jews to the king as, as dangerous and deserving of death. And so he plays on the king's fear, and then he, he even offers him money. He says, oh, I'll pay for this work. I'll give you 10,000, um, uh, what are they called here in the text? Uh, 10,000 talents. And this is a large sum of money. They, uh, most scholars have uh, estimated this is about two-thirds of what the king would generate in a year of taxing. So this is significant. So again, to see how Haman has risen to power and wealth, that he's leveraging what he has to get what he wants. See, villains can use their money to influence in, in ungodly ways. What another example of what not to be. Use your money to benefit others for the Lord, not to, to get your own way and, and to do evil. And so the king allows him to put together this decree. And so he rejects his money because the king is also prideful. And in verse 11, look, it says, And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned, and on the 13th day of the first month, an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps, to the governors over all the provinces, to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script, and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. So the king has, has delegated his power to this villain. A copy of the document was issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. There's a lot of nuance here too just in how things have played out. So when we understand how their calendar works and they talk about the first month of Nisan and then later in the 12 month of Adar, all of that's taking place here is alluding that there is a decree that's going out and the Jews are going to hear that they're going to die in, in essentially 12 months, that they're going to be wiped out. What kind of emotional and mental, just ter like, that's terrifying. If our government decreed that, like, all right, hey, you know what, Christians are a real problem, so in December we're going to wipe them all out. And not only that, but the edict was delivered on the 13th day of Nisan. Now, this is significant because if you look at Leviticus 23, you'll find that on the 14th day of Nisan begins Passover. So this edict goes out that we're going to kill you right before Passover. And that's significant to the Jews because Passover is this great celebration where they remember that God spared them from his just wrath. And so wrath is now saying, guess what? I'm going to kill you right before Passover. This is, this is not subtle. This is not by chance. This is all the dramatic narrative that God is highlighting and saying, look, this is all the stakes that are set against you. I am God and you, I'm going to overcome all of this. You will not be forgotten. You will not be handed over to your enemies. And Haman, he's, he's a perfect example that when pride is unchecked, it can escalate to the sin of murder. And that's what he does. He has this massive scheme to destroy these people. And what does he do with the king after this goes out? The news breaks at the end of the chapter. In verse 15, the couriers went out hurriedly by the order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And here's what happened. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. And what was going on in the rest of their kingdom? But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Maybe translated, thrown into disarray. All of these questions are struggling. What did they do? What is taking place? We're going to go and kill all these people. We're going to wipe out all this. We're going to have this ethnic cleansing. And Haman and the king are just sitting down and having a drink. Again, these villains 
they contrast so well what sin can do to the heart of man so that we can greater understand the goodness of our God. I want you to turn with me and we'll start to land here. If you turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter three, and I think Psalm has been, the Psalms have been such a great way to reflect and process this story because we, we see that there are people that have lived through all kinds of circumstances and they wrestle with the Lord, they cry out to the Lord, and, and they process through literature or through song. I think Psalm 3 is really important for us because we may feel like we're facing maybe some subvert threats or, or covert threats. They're not decrees yet, but, but we can sense the spiritual warfare that is going on within our culture and within our own life. And that may stir within us great worry. And David writes this, this great um, word here in Psalm chapter 3. We read with me. He says, O oh Lord, how many are my foes. Many rise against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. God can't save you. That's what the enemies are saying. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. And I love this. This is this, is this uh, response that he has. This is what's going on. He's anxious about his enemies overthrowing him. He feels the spiritual, the practical warfare that's upon him. And he does this in verse five. I lay down and slept. I'll tell you right now, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is sleep. Rest on it. Trust the Lord. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. And here's what I want you to hear. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. And this is hard because we're going to experience enemies in our life. We're going to experience calamity in our life. And the tension is just to take it all into our own hands. I have to fix it. And that's understandable because when you experience awful things, we desire safety. And a lot of us pursue safety through control. I want to tell you, you can't control all the things in your life. You can't. You will exhaust yourself trying. You won't be able to sleep. So do what David does. Trust in the Lord. Reject the notion that your enemies are saying, your God can't save you. I want you to hear this. Regardless of existential threats, trust in God's protection. God's providence triumphs over evil plots. Things that feel terrible that seem contrary to the character and nature of God in our society are abound. Prideful people like Haman are celebrating in the streets, wanting to do evil. We have to trust that God brings salvation and that we can rest in him. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for the story of Esther Lord, even as we read about this, the, the, the evil of Haman, that you are a God who will not be mocked and that you are a God who is in control. Lord, help us to trust in that truth. Help us not to fret. Lord, I pray that you would help our spirit to be able to rest and know as we obey you and walk with you, we will experience your peace that surpasses all understanding. And Lord, we do long for your redemptive work to come. Jesus, we long for the day that you're gonna come and make all things right. 
Lord, thank you for the promise that there'll be a day where there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more suffering, and there'll be no more sin. Until that day comes, give us the strength to trust you, and may you bless us with your spiritual endurance. We pray this in your name.